thought it was Mia no pause. <laughs> <laughs> Not Milano pause. All right, we can cut that. We're using no. it. This is going to be really hard to edit. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Doc Talk. Today, we are going to talk about some things in the news. Three things. Today, we're going to talk about early menstruation, Milano pause, and geriatric pregnancies. Oh, why did you have to say geriatric? I, that's, it's literally the script. So, Dr. Choi. Yes. A new study was published published recently in JAMA, mm -hmm. which is the Journal of American Medical Association. Medical Association. Yes. Yep, also called JAMA. Um, and it's raising a lot of questions, and they've seen it in the news a lot, and there are concerns that about menstrual cycles and puberty specifically. Um, and so the study showed that more girls are getting their first periods, or menarche, mm -hmm. sooner um, than previous generations, and experiencing longer periods of menstrual irregularity as well. Uh, people are worried about what this means for this generation and future generation of girls and women um, and their long-term health and fertility. So first, I think we should get the context out of the way. Um, what is the average age of menarche or first um, periods typically? It's a great question. There's actually some ethnic variation, but on average, it's somewhere usually between 12 and 13. Um, although studies have shown that, for instance, um, African-American girls, black girls, tend to have menarche at a slightly earlier age. And even so, for every group, um, there seems to be a forward push, meaning earlier first period happening more and more. Lisa, I am so glad that you brought up this study, which I thought was really um, interesting. But how was the data collected? Because they looked at like 71,000 um, individuals, which is a lot of data points. Yep, so they looked at 71,000 individuals mm -hmm. um, enrolled through the Apple Research app. Yep. So through Apple Research, which I think is great, people using their iPhones. Mm -hmm. um, and the women who were in the study were born between 1950 and 2005. Wow. So a long span, which yeah. I think is also really interesting. And importantly, multiple ethnicities, so representative of white, Asian, um, black, and Hispanic populations. That's, that's actually terrific. Um, and so what the study showed is mm -hmm. that girls, as I said, are in the U.S. Um, are getting their first period about six months earlier mm -hmm. on average than they did in the 50s and 60s. Um, between 1950 and 1969, girls on average got their periods, like you were saying, around 12 and a half years of age. Right. Um, in 2000 to 2005, that average is seen to have lowered to 11 years and nine months mm -hmm. of age. Um, and the number of girls getting their period before the age of nine, which is considered very early. Super early, yep, yeah. As you know, um, has also more than doubled in that time, which I think is probably what most people are concerned with. Um, early men's, earlier menstrual periods were found to be much more pronounced, I think we should talk about this, among girls from racial and ethnic minorities and those from lower income. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious if you have thoughts on why that would when be. I, when I looked at that study, when I looked at past studies looking at why is Medicare happening at an earlier age, um, there has been a lot of interest looking at is the growing rate of obesity. So the prevalence of obesity in the U.S. is unfortunately on the rise and has been for the past few decades. Mm -hmm. Is that a factor? Because in order to turn on your brain control system to get your eggs to start to like wake up and ovulate and create these periods, you need to reach a certain actually fat content level. So we look at things like geeky terms like leptin and you know IGF-1 affecting the hypothalamic pituitary axis. But in this study, I thought it was interesting that um, the reviewers found that having a higher BMI, being overweight or be, um, obese in these young teen years and childhood years, maybe was attributable about close to 50% of the time to explain why menarche was happening at an earlier age, but not the only factor. So there were other factors that they looked at and hypothesized about, including especially for those in lower income brackets, um, could um, having a very stressful, not just having, you know, my parents like send me to my room once for no dinner because I uh, stayed out late last night, but the like, continued psychosocial stressors mm -hmm. um, and the allostatic load, for instance, of minorities being exposed to constant racism, could that somehow impact and turn on their um, brain ovarian connection even further? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the purported uh, potential issues. The other thing is looking at endocrine disruptors, so things that we find in plastics, um, things that we find in certain like lotions and creams. Could all of those, because they mimic hormones that are mm -hmm. in our body, um, sometimes block hormones, could that also somehow be another factor that leads to this early menarche issue? And the plastics, right? Like, right. A, a like phthalates, yes, right? Yes. BPAs, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Things that you know people like to bring up a lot. Yep, all of yeah. those are important. Um, 
it the study also talks about, as I mentioned, that it, not only are girls getting periods younger, um, but that also it's taking longer to get to a regular menstrual cycle. That's, that's really interesting because mm-hmm. normally you can take, and I always counsel patients who are worried about their their children going through menarche. It can take. Um, a healthy female, like one to two years, mm-hmm. for their brain to start to like settle in, calm down, and actually get their periods on a regular cycle. But more and more, especially in this study, their um, researchers are finding that it can take over two years, it can take three years or longer. And the concern there is, as we know, when we look at, for instance, patients who have like polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm-hmm. who don't have very regulated periods, um, what researchers are finding is that having these longer time frames where it takes longer for these periods in these teenage girls to regulate. They're more likely to potentially have lower fecundability, so less likely to get pregnant in their adulthood, maybe more than infertility issues. Um, there also may be an increased risk for things like all-cause mortality related to things like cardiovascular disease when you're older, um, increased risk for things like ovarian, uterine, and breast cancer. Um, so again, this is the reason why researchers and doctors care about this so much. Yeah, why it matters. Yeah. Um, so we, t- we wanted to maybe to close this out, talk a little bit about why this may be. Um, and so you mentioned BMI was part of it, and yeah. certainly people are, people who live in lower income areas experience food deserts, right? Yeah. Healthy food deserts. Oh, so th- thank you. Actually, sorry for cutting you off. The other thing I forgot to mention was potential play of diet yeah. and dietary content, and is that yeah. somehow messing with a young girl system yeah. and all leading to this? I think we talk a lot about as if that's a choice, but I think it matters a lot where you live Absolutely. and what you have access to and what right. you can afford. Right. Um, and so income seems to play a factor. Race mm-hmm. and ethnicity tend seem to be part of the factor and obesity. And you also, I don't know if we touched on air pollutants, but I think that was yeah, something that's that part found. of the whole, you know, endocrine disruptor. And just to be very clear, it's not the particular race or ethnicity, but all the other components, yeah. right? The psychosocial stressors that those um, individuals may be encountering that all kind of conflate and lead to these you know, medical issues like early menarche. Yep. Right? Um, how do you see early menarche affecting fertility specifically? So again, going back to my um, prior comment in terms of if it's taking longer for a female to get regular periods, if she's not ovulating, releasing an egg on a regular basis, that's going to lead to a lot of um, potential for more fertility problems and difficulty for that individual trying to conceive on their own without having to see a doctor. Um, and if does early menarche mean early menopause? Great question. I tried to look at that. I couldn't find any good data, but I always, you know, I'm open to suggestions and new educational material. So maybe more about the irregularity of menstruation right. and not like right. that they'd go into menopause. But also sooner. later on in life, because um, again, as we, as you and I know, when we talk to patients, our eggs are just destined to slough off and die off, whether you get regular periods or whether you get periods, you know, at all. Sometimes women will be like, well, I, I stopped my periods with my IUD or pill for 10 years. My eggs are there, right? I'm like, mm, sorry, no, let's do some testing, right? Myth bust. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a bonus point. Uh-huh, that's a bonus Good point. point. Yeah, you're welcome. So shifting gears, mm. um, I think that was a nice sequitur, actually, because mm-hmm. we're going to talk about menopause. And I learned a new term mm-hmm. recently. Um, I think Oprah talked us all a new term or someone did called millenopause Mm -hmm. Um, and it is recently featured in Oprah's daily new term of the week millennials meet menopause I am a millennial um, and uh, so was very interested in this in particular because millennials are beginning to enter menopause right so people my age are starting that perimenopause menopause midlife journey Um, and so can you describe you and I actually talk about this all the time, but we're mm-hmm. going to pretend like we don't. Yep. Um, can you describe perimenopause and when it starts? So perimenopause, so menopause, average age is somewhere around 50, 51 for American women, although it can start, as we've seen over and over again, as early as sometimes for some young women in their 20s and 30s. And menopause is a discrete point in time. It's when you get your very last period, but it's a retrospective definition because then you have to wait for 12 months and just have no period. And then if 12 months elapse since your last period, hooray, and I'll say hooray for some good reasons, if you're well supported, you're in menopause. In the years leading up to that final period, that perimenopause, which then extends to one year after your last period, can be years, sometimes four, five, six, seven years or more. And before that last period shows up, oftentimes women will report in you know, irregular periods, 
they, they'll say, I used to have clockwork 28, 30-day mm-hmm. periods, and now they're like coming at 22-day intervals. Sometimes they're coming at 35-day intervals. They're shifting around week by week. 50-day intervals. Like exactly. Really irregular, right, as it yeah. becomes more irregular, sometimes you just skip total periods. People are like, maybe I'm pregnant. I'm like, ah, oh, you should just check your home pregnancy test. And if it's not, then, we, you know, you should talk to a doctor if you're concerned about, like, what else is going on. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of symptoms, I mean, you and I love to talk about this on our coffee clutch all the time. <laughs> uh, yes, hot flushes, big thing. 80% of women going through perimenopause menopause, menopause, experience hot flushes, and yet we're used to sucking it up. Um, It can also be very disruptive to sleep, which then also helps lead to more, um, you know, that plus the hormonal changes in menopause can lead to more transient, so temporary cognitive dysfunction, like brain fog happens to me all the time. It's like, where did I put my keys? Or I was going to (laughs) say something to her. What's your name again? Like that, and then it comes back, right? (laughs) Um, So I am curious, I have thoughts, but how do you think this generation, my generation, the millennial generation, Mm -hmm. will experience or, I guess, experience menopause differently than previous? I think they're... um they're in a very you're in a very fortunate group because yeah. I think there is a, there's a cornucopia of great resources. Mm-hmm. Um, you like that cornucopia? I do. I do. By the I way, as an aside, and this is like shows how you're not a snob and I am. I thought it was Mia no buzz. <laughs> <laughs> Not menopause. All right, we can cut that. We're using no, it. But I think <laughs> they're great resources. There are these great digital um, apps to learn more about menopause mm-hmm. and menopause coaching um, apps. They're also now very well-trained um, and well-intentioned and well-trained. This is the key thing because only about a third of OBGYN residency programs train their residents in menopause, which is ridiculous to me. Um, and now there are these providers, just like our mm-hmm. um, progeny providers, provide expert menopause relevant treatment um, and evidence-based support um, as opposed to just telling everyone um, sorry I'm afraid to give you any kind of hormone therapy it's uh, it's gonna cause you cancer so you shouldn't even think about using it which is not true yeah um, I also think in addition to all of those things which I agree with mm-hmm. um, and maybe because of all of those things or those things are a result of, I think, people in my generation more likely to talk about it yes. and, like, be open about it. And that not only leads to not feeling like you're going crazy, right, mm-hmm. or being really isolated, but also getting access and best practices. And I think that's really important. A- absolutely. Like, I was dumbfounded. I was at a benefit conference a few weeks ago. And the benefit leader, she was a little bit older than me, and she said even 10 years ago when they were trying to offer and discuss benefits, she was told not to use the term menopause because it was not a word to be spoken, kind of like Voldemort. I mean, ridiculous, right? Yeah. So I think building that community, knowing that you're not alone, knowing that this is a very normal and natural process of getting older, and then finding the right help, knowing to ask for the help, not being abashed, um, and just celebrating your best self. I love it. Yeah. So we are moving on to our last topic of Doc Talk today. Mm-hmm. Um, an offensive term, no. okay. <laughs> uh, a term that neither of us like very much to talk about, or t- the term that's used, which is geriatric pregnancy. Yeah, let's get rid of that one. We don't love it. No. But what is meant by that, really, is mm. that um, the age of people's pregnancies, people are having pregnancies later in life, yep. women in particular, or birthing parents are having pregnancies later in life, um, and it's happening more frequently, I think, for a lot of reasons. Um, The CDC said recently that more than half of US babies born in 2023 had birth mothers in their 30s or older. Oh, wow. Which is is a change, right? And in places we live in New York, places like New York, it's even older than that. Um, As this age is becoming the potential maternal sweet spot for women today, I wanted to talk to you, Dr. Choi, about how women can be setting themselves up for success if they are intentionally delaying childbearing. Okay, so one, just be aware, and this is definitely not fear-mongering, that unfortunately age does matter, especially for the person who has eggs, because we're born with a finite amount. We don't, we can't recreate eggs, so once they're gone, they're gone. Um, and the quality of those eggs that have been sitting in your two ovaries, if you have those two ovaries in place, have been there since before you were born. So as they sit there waiting to be used and called up, their ability to create normal, healthy pregnancies goes down. So what I see all the time, and you've also seen this on your side when you've been counseling people, is that 
as a person goes from age 30 to 40 to 45 trying to conceive, the rate of fertility each month goes down and the rate of miscarriages go up. Mm -hmm. So again, doesn't mean that say you are 39 and you want to start trying to have a kid that you're doomed to failure. Absolutely not. But know then that if you've been trying and you're over the age of 35, that it's not actually overly hasty to think about seeking the proper advice and evaluation from a reproductive endocrinologist if you've been trying for close to six months um, and it hasn't been clicking at home, for instance. Or over a year, certainly. Right, yeah. definitely over a year, especially if you're under the age of 35, but I tell everyone, if you're 35 and above, if you've been trying for six months, go ahead and see someone and just get evaluated at the very least. And if you're at 40, go ahead and start trying on your own and make that appointment at the same time. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so that's for trying to get pregnant, which is great. Mm -hmm. What about for those who are lucky enough, if that is their goal, to achieve a pregnancy, what are their risks in terms of pregnancy? Okay, so risks and the reason why some, that term geriatric pregnancy is there, there is that medical threshold. When um, individuals uh, decide to get pregnant, carry a pregnancy age 35 and above, they're more likely to have obstetrical complications, things like um, intrauterine growth restrictions of smaller size babies, um, more likely to have a cesarean section delivery on the horizon versus a vaginal delivery, more likely to develop uh, pregnancy-related blood pressure issues like preeclampsia, we can talk more about that later, um, gestational diabetes. So these are serious health concerns, and that's the reason why doctors try to categorize individuals who are pregnant between, you know, in terms of under 35 versus 35 and above. Um, important to have good prenatal counseling. Absolutely. Get really good care during pregnancy. And to your point earlier, if you're trying to become pregnant or you know you're going to delay, um, get um, in good care. Yep. So well. even like to set yourself up for success, just like we've had this, you know, program set up for our members, is even if like pregnancy is even like a glimmer of a thought in your head, make sure that preconceptionally you're thinking about eating right, you know, healthy plant-based Mediterranean type diet, exercising if it's safe for you to do so, maintaining a healthy body mass index, um, trying to make sure that you're taking that folic acid pill, really, really important to help decrease the risk of having a baby with a birth defect. All of those small things can lead to um, better outcomes. Yep. And in terms of the shift and normalizing it, mm -hmm. um, I think in addition to those things, we agreed already not calling it geriatric. Yes. Let's um, get rid of that, please. Let's get rid of that. Yeah. Um, I also think one thing we didn't talk about, I don't think, is normalizing egg freezing. Mm -hmm. um, if you have access through your benefit, amazing. If not, yeah. um, there are ways that you can make it more affordable. Absolutely. Um, talk about it with friends and partners. Egg freezing is not a guarantee, but it's a way um, to feel a little better about me. Absolutely. Delay. Just to give yourself another layer or cushion, right? Yeah. If you're not quite ready yet now. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Um, that is all we have time for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Remember, this information is for informational purposes and does not constitute medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to your physician or qualified health provider. I love our doc talks. Me too. I thought these were really great. We, sh we should do this like every day. Yeah, we yeah. should. Right. <laughs> um, if you have any other thoughts on topics that you'd like us to doc talk about, mm -hmm. please drop them in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and thank you for joining.